thank you for attending this session. Um, I'm Yuki, uh, working for cyber agent in Japan. And so I'm technical lead, Kubepro AutoML and training working group. And so I'm technical lead, um, Kubepro, Kube, Kubernetes, Q, and Revier for Kube Control Manager Java API. So today, um, my co-speaker, Andre, is unfortunately unable to attending this session in person. So, but so I got um, videos from him. So I will play the video from him. So let's start. So today's session is so democratizing AI model training on Kubernetes with Kubeflow training job and job set. So the first part is um, Android's part. So let me phrase videos. Hey, KubeCon, I'm Andre, I work at Apple. I'm also a member of the Kubeflow steering committee. I've been in this committee for like six and a half years. I've been involved in development of projects such as training operator and Katib. And today, before we're actually going to share you how we're going to democratize model training on top of Kubernetes, I want to speak a little bit about the background and the history. So let me first talk about the data scientists. So in ideal world, data scientists, what they want, they want to write their PyTorch code and want to have, have a way to actually quickly scale it. And the tricky part, because it's actually interactive process, they want to have a way to actually repeat this multiple times before they find like the best configuration for their model so they can push it to production. But in reality, there are many things which are associated with this process. For example, you need to make sure you can properly configure your Docker images, your data access. Maybe you want to like enable different policies like failure or success policies for fault tolerance. Maybe you want to enable the gang scheduling, or maybe you want to configure your uh, resource queues for efficient uh, resource management. So we call all of this as kind of infrastructure pain, which uh, data scientists need to deal with before they can write the code and scale it. And we need to find a way how we can abstract it and simplify it. Also, there are many, many challenges which, which is associated with model training. For example, right now we live in a world of generative AI, models become very complex, it has billions of parameters, data set also very huge. So we need to find a way how we can distribute them across multiple GPU devices. Also, we need to make sure like we efficiently manage the computer resources, uh, like GPUs and TPUs. Uh, also, like we need to find uh, provide an API for all this diverse ML infrastructure and all these new distributed strategies like FSDP, data and model parallelism. So if we summarize all of this, like what users actually want, they want to write their code and they want to scale it. So they want to make sure like the environment is actually simple, flexible and scalable. And they want to make sure like they can uh, just be focusing on the model development instead of like infrastructure. So with that, I just want to quickly also talk about the Kubeflow. So I hope many of you are familiar with this ecosystem, but just to summarize, Kubeflow is the ecosystem of the different open source projects they can be used as a standalone applications. So I have a different projects for data processing, training, tuning, serving, pipelines. So Kubeflow like a bridge between like ML ecosystem and the cloud ecosystem. All these projects run natively on top of Kubernetes. And in this session, we only be focusing on training operator. So training operator is actually the standalone open source project, which can uh, run distributed training on top of Kubernetes for most popular frameworks like PyTorch, JAX, TensorFlow. It also offered the Python SDK and API to play with. It's also like capable to do LLM fine tuning, uh, elastic training. We also have integration with Q, Volcano for uh, advanced resource management and job scheduling. We also have an MPI support for different distributed uh, techniques. Uh, and uh, we, 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 have, we have also like the features around all reduced type of training. So I just want to also spend a little bit of time about the history of Kubeflow and training operator. So back in 2017, when Google actually introduced a uh, Kubeflow project, it was, a, uh, they kind of like created the component called TensorFlow operator, which kind of orchestrate the TF jobs. So TF jobs is actually allows you to, to run TensorFlow tasks on top of Kubernetes natively. Uh, so back then, uh, Kubernetes was lacking with some uh, advanced batch uh, uh, features. So that is why we have to implement all the features by ourselves. So in 2018 and 2019, we expanded support with 
with more frameworks. Back the time, I actually joined the community. So we started support PyTorch, MXJob, uh, MPI, XGBoost, and we have a lot of custom resources which allows you to do distributed training just for the specific framework. Also, like we have a lot of these different operators, we decided to consolidate them in the single operator. So we call the training operator V1 in 2021 which actually like a single Kubernetes uh, operator, which managing all those CRDs. And back then, like Kubernetes, was in, uh, int uh, Kubernetes introduced the batch working group, which is designed to actually simplify and improve the way to run HPC and AI workloads. So there, are, was a, there were a lot of great initiatives like queue, uh, job set, leader working set projects, which also like improved the, the running those workloads. Also, like many features was contributed directly to the jobs, like index jobs, portfolio other policies, which also improved the, uh, the AI model training uh, workloads. And back then, so right now in 2024, we actually uh, try to find, uh, uh, we actually try to see how we can consolidate our effort being Kubernetes and Qflow community. So we can provide the unified infrastructure for all the users who want to use Kubernetes as the primary tool for model training. And so uh, we want to see how we can consolidate our efforts. So with that, I'm super excited to announce you the new project, which we call Qflow Training V2. And uh, we have several goals uh, for this project that we um, identified. So the first goal, it should be very simple to use and simple to scale. So since we work with data scientists, we want to make sure it's the Python is our kind of main interface uh, to interact with the APIs. So data scientists, they don't need to work with the Docker, don't need to work with the YAML, just Python. Also, like because right now many people just do the post training, we want to make sure uh, this project is capable to quickly fine tune all the favorite LLMs. Um, also, want to provide the robust support for all this um, um, diverse ML ecosystem. We want to streamline the model and data set pre initialization so we, we can make sure like this task can be delegated on, on the CPU workloads and reduce the, the cost uh, and optimize cost for, for, for GPUs. And the most important thing, we want to consolidate efforts between Kubernetes and the Qflow communities so we can work together to actually make Kubernetes, uh, to actually democratize Kubernetes for model training workloads and not duplicate our efforts. So I think like the, uh, the best thing to actually see it live, but show like the demo. And so let me show you a few examples of this new API. So. Right now, in this demo, I'm going to play the role of data scientist. And the first example, actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to develop the PyTorch model, which will do the image classification. And just this very simple example, but just to show like the power of the scale. And this model actually will uh, do the, the fashionist, uh, uh, Question is uh, data set uh, image classification. So as, you, as we can see on the left side, I have my workspace, I have multiple Python files. So I have the first file called dataset.py. This file actually contains the configuration for my data set. So here I'm just using the open source question is data set. I'm converting my images to the tensors before I can uh, use it in my training code. So then I have the file called model.py. So this model contains the my actually Convolutional neural network model, which has like two convolutional layers and two linear layers. And as output, we have like 10 different images because we have 10 samples of our data set. And we have like the forward loop from my model. And the third file called train.py. And this file actually contains the training loop for my uh, actual PyTorch training. So here it's very simple, just native PyTorch API. Uh, I want to make sure like my if my, my code can be distributed across uh, across uh, multiple PyTorch nodes. So for that, I'm using the distributed uh, Torch distributed API. Uh, also, like I'm reusing the assets from different files. So here I'm importing the MNIS dataset from my dataset model. From this file, I'm attaching this dataset to the data loader. Um, then I'm attaching my dataset to the distributor so the data can be distributed. Uh, so the next step for me is actually getting the model from the model uh, from the model file and attaching this model to the to the device. And the next, like the final step, which is defining like the, the PyTorch training loop. So here is again, it's just native PyTorch code when I have my uh, optimizer, when I'm running my feed forwarding loop, and, and the very ends when my training is complete, I'm just exporting model all the way to the S3 so I can do my model evaluation. So I'm defining my training loop here, like the whole of the uh, native PyTorch API again. What is my next step? Uh, so my next step is actually running this code, make sure it's actually working. So I am importing from train.py, uh, my train PyTorch model, AP, uh, my train PyTorch model function. I just want to make sure it's actually runnable. 
as we can see, it is running on CPU. It's actually uh, just run on a few batches, and Tronic is actually running. So I'm happy with it. I want to scale it, right? So back to my presentation, I write my PyTorch code. I want to scale it. So what is my next step? Uh, it's actually using the Qflow API. So for this, we have this new API called List Runtimes. So this is the Python API, which actually lists you several runtimes you as a data scientist can play with. So you can think as a runtime like a blueprint or configuration, uh, which contains the optimal configuration that I can use to perform different tasks. So runtimes can be used for pre-training or it can be used for post-training. For a pre-training runtime, it means like I can use them for if I want to train a model in a large data set from scratch, uh, and I have like runtime for JAX, for Torch. Here also runtime shows that how many devices by default is going to use, and also what is the type of the device. And we have runtime for post training. The post training runtime can be used for fine tuning, like for example, supervised fine tuning or reinforcement learning with uh, human feedback algorithms. So which actually allows me to do the quickly LLM evaluation and LLM fine tuning. So for here, we're also like showing the default devices this runtime is going to use uh, for me, uh, if I want to play with it. So for this example, I'm going to use the Torch distributed runtime. So I'm going to assign this runtime to my variable. And the next step is actually uh, running using the train API. So again, it's simple Python API, which uh, which can actually accept my training function as the input and accepting the scaling counting. Like for example, how many PyTorch nodes I want to use and how like how much resources I'm going to use for every node. So for this particular example, I'm going to use the two GPU and three nodes. So in total, we're going to distribute my data across six GPUs. So this actually generate the random job ID. So this is my job. Uh, I can use the Python API to uh, list the job. And this is actually creating the job uh, on the Kubernetes cluster. And the, th the thing is we're also creating the snapshot of my file system of my workspace, which we have on the left side with all those files and putting those files on my distributed training job. So the files is di are distributed across all of the devices and all of the PyTorch nodes. So the next step for me, I can also run the get job API and at least all the components. So all of the jobs, they uh, they contain multiple components. So because I'm running this job on the three nodes, it has three components. So every component represents a separate PyTorch node and it also has the devices. So since we're running the two GPU per node, every component has the uh, two GPU has been attached to this uh, to this component. So then when I checking my components and checking my jobs, I can get the logs from my training uh, from my uh, using using the get job logs API. And as we can see here, we here we're using uh, GPU. The world size equals to six because we distribute our code uh, our code across um, six devices. And uh, the data, since like here we uh, distribute across six devices, the six thousand samples uh, we distributed, and every GPU is only processing the ten thousand samples. So at the very end, when the training is complete, we're exporting model to the S3. So the power of this, again, I am as a data scientist, I'm just working with the PyTorch, I'm just working with Python, I quickly run my code, evaluate it, and I'm scale it. And the thing is like, if I'm happy with it, my code is ready to go to production because everything is being packaged as the Python files, and I can create the unit test, I can package them, I can uh, share it. And again, I can also download my model from S3 here. And as we can see, the model should, should appear on the left side, yeah, model.pt. And I can try test my model with the sample images. So we're going to pass uh, some of the testing images. So this is all the samples from the data set. And let's see what kind of output our model will be generated. So yeah, we can see that the green actually indicated that the model correctly predict the image, red indicate the model actually incorrectly predict an image. And so we can run it several times and several batches just to see what is the results of my model. So it's very simple, but it's very powerful because I can control scale, I can control my code. I I just, I don't really worry about anything else like images, YAMLs, just Python, just PyTorch, and it's very scalable. So the next example that I want to show, actually the, the, the how we can use this post-training runtime. So for this, we're going to fine tune Llama 3.2 with one billion parameters. So the first step for me as a data scientist, similar to the previous example, I'm just listing all of those runtimes. So, and I'm going to use this torch tune Llama 3.2 runtime. So this runtime by default using four GPU devices and uh, how I can kick off 
uh, the job for me. Instead of passing the function, I can use this train API to just passing the dataset configuration and the trainer configuration. So we as the Qflow community are planning to support a lot of uh, LLM runtimes for data scientists to play with, but basically we pre-create the, uh, the initialization and we pre-create the trainer and data scientists just need to adjust the parameters they want to tweak. For example, this uh, in this particular sample, I, I'm adjusting the LoRa config. So we're going to do the parameter efficient fine tuning. I'm going to just pass the rank equals to four for my LoRa config. And I'm going to use the Alpaca data set, which contains uh, several instructions, which I want to use to fine tune my, my Llama 3.2. So again, same API, same function. If I don't want to pass this configuration, I can even you know hide it and use the default runtime configuration. Uh, but I want to adjust it to make sure I can also adjust the lower config. So it should generate the random job ID. So same API, I can list all of my jobs. Uh, I can see that the one job has been created and the one job already succeeded, the previous one. I can also list all of my components from my jobs. So compared to the previous example, since this component is actually using the post-training runtime or blueprint, we can call it, it also has the initializer a job, which actually do the model and that is the initialization on CPU to reduce the GPU uh, time when actually we don't need it, right? And then it actually distributes this data across all of these nodes. So in this example, we're just using the one node with four GPU uh, in, in this node. So then we can also use the Python API to get the logs from my data set initializer. We can see that data set has been downloaded. Also, we can check like the model initializer logs that the model also has been downloaded uh, from, the, uh, from, the, from the hugging phase. And we can get the logs from uh, from our using the GetJob Logs API. So this actually trainer behind the scenes at using FSDP to distribute our model across uh, multiple shards, so we can reduce the memory footprint and make sure we can actually train this model on V100 GPUs. Also, like since we're passing the four, we're using the uh, one node with four GPUs, the world size equals to four. And as we can see here, the lower config, like the config that we pass, is actually being propagated here, so we only train. 400,000 uh, model parameters instead of 1 billion parameters, so it's much faster and we can actually see the results. So here we actually run the training. Um, this is running right now inside the training nodes. And at the very end, when the training will be complete, we also do the model evaluation and we exporting the PEFT adapters to the S3 uh, when the model is complete. So here we can see the memory footprint, which is like around 12 GB and what is GPU type. So model PEF adapters have been has been exported to S3. So what is my next step? I want to test my model, right? So I want to import this model all the way from S3 to my notebook. Uh, we, this is downloading the adapters. And this is like loading the adapters to the Hugging Face API. So we can make sure just to see how our model will, will perform. And let's just pass some random prompts. So let's ask the most complicated question to the LLM, how many R's in strawberry? Um, I hope our model, okay, our model is pretty, as I can see, it's uh, pretty clever. It's actually can, uh, you know, uh, answer such complicated question. Uh, let's try to see if I run it again. What, okay, okay, for no, not every time, not every time, but at least, you know, we can see some results. So yeah, so we can see the results from our LLM. Let's try to pass some other prompt, like for example, what is kubecon and what is kubeflow? So we're passing the instructions, we're passing the input to our model and we're waiting for response. Uh, so right now, like, as we can see, the model producing results, KubeCon and KubeFlow 2 popular tools, a broader Kubernetes ecosystem, KubeCon is a conference, but KubeFlow, it's a suite of tools to enable build, train, and deploy machine learning models using Kubernetes. Great. So I'm actually getting my model. I was evaluating this model and I'm getting my results. It's very quick. It's very powerful. And me as a data scientist, I don't really worry about any of those infrastructure APIs. I'm just working with Python. So what we actually saw, um, and let me go back to my slide. So what we saw, it's extremely simple, but it's very powerful behind the scenes because it's flexible enough and it's scalable enough. So first of all, I want to speak more about like simplicity and flexibility. So we've been working with uh, running model training for like almost like seven years. So right now we see the different type of persona 
which we interact with. So the first of all, we can identify the DevOps engineer and MLOps engineer persona. So for those folks like DevOps engineer, usually they know the Kubernetes API, they know how to configure the resource queues, uh, the volumes and other Kubernetes API parameters. And we have the MLOps engineer who actually probably not like familiar with Kubernetes API, but they know how to deal with the MPI, with Torch. So they know some ML configurations. So for those folks, we created the new API, new CRD called training runtime which they can pre-create. And this runtime can be a blueprint or configuration for data scientists uh, they can play with and evaluate. Because data scientists, they only know the PyTorch, they, they only need to know the PyTorch API. So they can quickly evaluate, like they can quickly run their experiments reusing those blueprints that, that was pre-created by their platform engineers. And then behind the scenes, we're going to create the job set, which actually will create the jobs to perform the, the fine tuning or distributed training. So what we saw in the demo behind the scenes, something like this happening, this is the life cycle for LLM runtime the MLOps engineer and DevOps engineer together, they build those runtimes. We, again, as a community, also are planning to provide the state-of-the-art runtimes to run those fine-tuning on top of Kubernetes. These runtimes can be reused by data scientists, so they can use the Python SDK to kick off the job. So job will actually create the job set, and the job set actually will create the multiple tasks like initializer job and the trainer job. And the initializer on CPU will do the, the asset initialization, like data set and model. And then the trainer actually create the PyTorch cluster to distribute uh, those workloads across multiple devices and the multiple nodes and workers. And then we, we also like exporting model all the way to the cloud storage. Also, I have a custom like, you know, initializers that train, like we as the, the open source team is working on in, in training operator. We also have the custom LM trainer that you can tweak to work with different models. So the designers don't even need to worry about how to configure those complex distributed environment. And also, like, I want to speak a little bit about simplicity. So as we saw in the demo, data scientists, they only work with Python. They can use Python to list the, those runtimes. They can use the Python to kick off the jobs. They can use the train API to just, you know, uh, pass the configurations. They can adjust. They can pass the whole training function uh, to the train API. So this training function can be evaluated on every PyTorch node and it can be distributed. So no Docker images, just Python and just PyTorch. Uh, similar to this, uh, we converting this, uh, we're using this new customer certification called train job. And this train job has a minimal amount of parameters that a scientist can tweak. For example, it has the configuration for trainer, configuration for data set, and configuration for model. So trainer means like what kind of parameters you want to pass directly to the, your trainer, like LoRa config, for example. Uh, data set config means like what data set you want to use, what parameters you want to adjust. Model config also allows you to specify the output of your model. For example, if you want to export your adapters to, to like to some custom image or to different like, you know, uh, blob, uh, like cloud storage. And also like have, we had this runtime reference where actually uh, have the reference of the runtime that platform engineers actually prepare for data scientists. So for that, let me pass it to Yuki. So he will tell you more about what is this runtime and how it can be useful to create those blueprints for data scientists uh, so they can work with. OK, so let me switch to my slide. Just a second. All right. Okay, so from this slide, so I'm going to introduce runtime CLDs and such mechanisms. As Andre mentioned, uh, we introduced two type of CLDs um, based on the persona. So the runtimes are aimed to be used by ops related developers like DevOps and ML Ops engineer. Additionally, so we have one type of runtime, but we have two rebel runtimes. The first rebel is cluster training runtime, um, which can be created at the cluster scope training runtime. This is so useful when the ops engineer want to distribute the reusable runtimes to all ML engineer, to all Kubernetes tenants. The second rebel is training runtime, which can be created at the namespace called training runtime. We are assuming the situation 
where the ML or ML ops engineer want to create the project specific runtimes. Next, um, let me introduce the each block of runtime. The first block is for machine learning specific parameter specifications. This allows us to specify the number of nodes, number of processes in the single part, and so on. That is machine learning framework specific parameters. This will, this will be set up by MLOps engineers since DevOps engineers sometimes do not have ML framework specific knowledge. The second block is gang scheduling parameters. As you know, so machine learning workloads, um, gang scheduling is so important. So the training operator supports the Kubernetes scheduler plugins call scheduling plugin. So when we install the call scheduler plugin into your cluster, this field can be used. Final block is job set template. And so job set template details, so let me introduce next slide. This is the job set template part. So the job set template block has all of job set spec fields, but we have some cube for dedicated reserved replicated jobs and container name. The one of important reserved name is trainer node, which is used by main training processes. Additionally, we will separately start the model and storage initialization jobs and insert some parameters to train node, as Andre described in demo. And so this is a corresponding table uh, what runtimes and machine learning frameworks are supported. So current Kubeflow B1 API is supporting the PyTorch, TensorFlow, Hugging Face, MPI, JAX, Puzzle Puzzle, XGBoost by dedicated custom resources like PyTorch job and TS job. But since Beats API, we are planning to support all of B1 API supporting machine learning frameworks and more by runtime CLD. It's not dedicated to custom job API. Because as you know, the ML ecosystem is growing much faster and the state of the art of frameworks are replaced rapidly. In this situation, it's challenging to follow the ML ecosystem and realize all of user requests by dedicated custom job API. For example, so sometimes users request, um, can we support um, these new parameters for XXX um, machine learning frameworks? And can we support the uh, not open source uh, machine learning framework um, um, in the training operator. So we decided to provide the extensible runtime and plugin mechanism so that we can easily support new frameworks and allow external communities and users setting up arbitrary parameters and machine learning framework separate from upstream Kubeflow community. Actually, um, we are planning to support the LLM runtimes like Rama, Gemma, Mistral by this extensible mechanism. In the next slide, let me introduce what is extensible runtimes. The training operator beats the API has two level extension mechanism. The first is this plugin mechanism, which can be extended part of upstream training 
and cluster training runtime. This extensive mechanism, which is significantly inspired by Cube Scheduler scheduling framework, but the mechanism is slightly different from the scheduling framework. This can be executed when the training operator builds the actual jobs based on the train job and training runtimes. The left side block pre-execution phase will be executed before the training operator build actual jobs. As an example, the custom variation extension points are executed as a variating admission webhook. The right side block main phase will be executed um, executed um, to build actual jobs. And each extension points are executed step by step by left side to right side. And this can be extensible, which means anyone can extend this framework and add arbitrary, arbitrary plugins to each extension points. For example, you can implement the company-specific parameter injection logic as a plugin. Next, this is another mechanism. As we mentioned in the train job slides, we can specify the arbitrary runtime name in the train job CLD. So if you want to use the in-house or third-party CLDs to deploy couple with train job, you can implement whole of runtime mechanism. Then you can use it as training operated jobs. Next, um, I'm going to talk about scalability and cost saving. Typically, um, training jobs are needed to prepare the base model and dataset. But we often execute such initializations in the init container or a main container, part of main trainer jobs or parts. That will lose the cost effectiveness because even though the downloading model and dataset are not used GPUs, those parts keep holding the GPUs. So the training operator will prepare the dataset and the model separate from main trainer jobs. The second um, is um, re removing um, duplication of between Kubeflow and Kubernetes community. In the B1 Kubeflow API, so we implement um, similar job mechanism by ourselves, but since B2 API, we rely on the job set and job API. The, sec the third part is so performance. So B1 API, so the training operator will create pods sequentially, but so in large training environment, that is pain points. So, but so Cube Controller Manager Job API can create pods um, concurrently. So, Beats API can improve um, performance and scalability uh, in the large machine learning training environment. So let me follow the, this session. So first, um, we are talking um, simple to use and scale. Second, um, Python is main user interface. Third, enabling quick fine tuning of LLMs only by Python. Provide, the fourth is provides robust support for the ML ecosystem. Fifth, streamline dataset and pre-trained model initialization. Finally, we talked 
consolidates efforts between Kubernetes and the Kubeflow communities. But we have some future work. So first is so we are planning to support um, some of um, fine tuning runtimes. Second is so supporting an MPI training B2 in the training operator B2. The third is so it's not only for Kubeflow, um, but so we are working on Kubernetes batch working group. For example, job set, serial job execution policy, um, stateful index job policy, multi cluster job dispatching with Q, and so quota management with Q. All right. So this is so community QR code. So if you have um, in, if you have interesting for this um, API, so please join our community meeting and GitHub issue. Here is a contributor for the Kubeflow training Beats API. It's not only for production codes, including documentation and discussion and testing codes. Thank you for all contributors. Finally, um, please send your feedback via this QR code. Thank you for listening to our presentation.